Hi, everyone. My name is Timothy Gager, and welcome to Virtual Friday's Dire Literary Series. And tonight, my guest is Jason Wright, poet, founder of Oddball Magazine and the Oddball Foundation, which are two separate entities. And uh, let me uh, show you their lovely website. Usually I show like, you know, all feature all the time, you know, but uh, Jason is very, very humble about his own work. And um, so, uh, so we'll just go uh, and, and show you where, where he's at and what he does. Here's Oddball Magazine. You got some poems, you got um, fiction, you got a lot of essays now, and you have a lot of advocacy for mental health and mental illness, which is wonderful. And, uh, and uh, we also, the foundation itself, the foundation deals directly with mental health and they've, and I'm not gonna tell you what they do because you gotta stick around until Jason is done reading and he will tell you exactly what they do, what they've been up, up to lately, what they've done in the past year and what they're looking to do in the future. So uh, that's all, uh, it's all great stuff. And so without anything else from me, let me turn it over to Mr. Jason Wright. Hi there. Um, Tim, thank you for having me on uh, uh, the Dire Literary Series. Really appreciate it. Um, I love this series and I, I think it's great that every week there's excellent authors and poets and there's a nice Q&A afterwards. I'm glad to be a part of it. So uh, I'm gonna read, um, can everyone hear me okay? Sound okay? Um, so yeah, my name is Jason Wright and I'm uh, the president of Oddball Foundation and the editor of Oddball Magazine. And uh, basically um, I just finished a book published called Train of Thought 2, Almost Home. And it's a continuation of Train of Thought, Poems from the Red Line. And what makes this book unique is that the poems were written um, all on the red line of Boston, Massachusetts and they flow where um, into each other. So I'm gonna read Charles MGH. Um, and uh, I'm going to then go into Train of Thought to uh, Almost Home. So this, uh, so this poem is called Something Like a Dream. Today I will melt in the 103 degree weather. Today I will break down this puzzle and put it all together. Today I fight for what my name is. Today I'm the realist and I feel like this, like I'm the truest poet to ever live because I live this shit and survive it. Some can live, some get by, some try too hard to fly but fill their head with drugs and misstep like stepping and slipping on the train tracks. You realize that this is it. One slip, you're finished. There's only one life I know of. So fuck all the other stuff and fill your heart with love. And maybe we will meet someday by some dumb luck, and I will give you a poem, and you will give me a hug, and I will say that I wrote this poem for you, and glad that you read my book, and beauty is only skin deep, sometimes you need to take a closer look, and maybe you will see the scars on my arms are far lesser than yours, and that is because I was given this gift to write these rhymes. I use my pen as a sword to kill the negativity, refill me when this world has gotten too much for me, and yeah, I have to take medications, and yeah, I might be different, but this gift that God has given me is the reason I'm still living and the ink isn't drying before the next page is written. And that's the end of Train of Thought, Poems from the Red Line. And the continuation of the, of the book begins with, we go on to Kendall. I used to live in Davis Square, so Kendall was a few stops away from where I was. So this one's called Reborn. And these poems were written in 20, 2011 and 2012, so they're in a different part of my life, but I wanted to write this because um, all of these poems are deeply affected by anxiety and how I felt on the train. Um, and I felt like writing was kind of the method that I used to kind of get through. Um, back then in 2012, there wasn't much talk about mental health and there definitely wasn't as much peer support. So um, this, this uh, poem is called Reborn. I am reborn. My life may be torn. I may have grown old. The warmth has gone cold, but I am reborn. Generated like a science age, old, but never told the science itself. 
I learned today how much it takes for me to break down. Learned today how to rebuild in this world I live, this mental dome guarded by medicated angels. Each weather word passed down from me to her, she gets the finalized product, a project that make nothing seem like everything's gone wrong, but the truth is I'm learning to live. It was raining, pouring down the remains of the day onto my borrowed umbrella. I promise I'll give it back, Marie, I said, and got up from my desk to leave. I wrote on a notepad, today is a new day. When I see it tomorrow, it will make me smile. It will put me in the right place. I just need to learn how to slow to a crawl. Then Grouch and Eli rock the track, and I'm back to writing the truth. I will let you know at the end of this book. Then the next poem is called At the End of This Book. This book I live in has 365 pages. So far, I'm on chapter 31. I don't remember the last 25. It feels like I've only been awake and alive since 26. Now I'm on my mission to change what's written to make the hero a villain and the heroine kill him. Can you manage the tragedies of life? Boys are born and grow old to watch their mother and father die. Then by that time, the little boy has grown into a man and has his own family. So where am I in this chapter? I'm a freak of nature. What's saved in a life overwhelmed with hatred? The heat I feel all year long until my blood runs cold, dripping off into the sidewalk. Dead blood don't clot. It just washes away with the rain. And all that's left is a stranger's stain, built and instrumented from someone's pain. On your own as you scream at the walls, you're not alone, I am. You are the man with the fam, and I'm stuck on this train, a man made of sand, screaming at walls, wanting to write poems, a letter to the world, but I'm bleeding ink on the sidewalk. Dead men can't write. It's almost time to stop. Almost time to stop. In a moment's notice, Jekyll will turn to hide. Jekyll will try to hide. In a, in a minute, St. Francis, we will have a sandwich. What am I writing? This is madness. This is madness. Well, here I go again with the flow, stupid and zen like a box of matches. We light and unite the same stage with new players to play this game. Some more people enter the train while I enter the Wu-Tang where I realize I have failed. They had no idea but see a loose leaf writer pounding the pavement, wishing I could fly like a bird or a frisbee or boomerang, I'll leave. Then my mind will travel free, but all of these comes back to me. It is this inertia that stops you and moves me. I'm just a diamond riding in London, swimming like locusts and seashells, being risen to the top to realize no one cares about seashells. And my mind retraces its steps to find an answer to a question I don't even know in a book called Dramatist and Dramedy. This is as good as it gets, folks. Choke on the melody. Let the tears fall freely. We all have to be free, dumb, free, dumb in this kingdom. I am king, dumb, and off you go. And just like that, I'll never see you again. talking to the man who made me. It was good to talk to you like lions roaring at each other, seeking dominance while letting the soft mane and calm eyes prove shadows in the night. We are stolen from the war. We are broken and sold. We are forever alone, but we are forever gold. How much is gold worth to them? And then we have a free prose and I write a free prose when I don't have a title for a poem and it's usually how I break through a writer's block. So it's called free prose. Sometimes we have to slow down and see the scenery for what it is, fleeting. Unless shot into an image or recorded like a visual solo, a strumming song ends with the last string, but pictures burn, strings break, and hearts break, and bend, lungs give out. Knees go, neckties start to strangle us whole like snakes and guns. Nooses, bracelets, we wear to the end and we remember the noose. You hung yourself with the bracelet I wear for you. The memory of figurines dancing behind an eased after all. All this is, is a puppet show. Wrong place. Listen to my words, friends. Listen to the pen scratching. Listen to tapping, tap, tap, tapping on your chamber door. It is only war and nothing more. My mind flies like birds out of a volcano after a destructing eruption of Pompeii aftermath of flies eating, biting, gnawing, and then sleep. The resilience of sleep till drugs make sleep come, listening to pain at black on repeat. The people on the block would like to believe that if they sleep and listen with intent, the sound will soothe them because aftermath comes the aftermath, listening to the woke erupt from blocks of closed schools, dimly lit poisoned wells, taxed and bruised, the people will wake. Right time. If you look at it right, you can see my bubbling skin numb from lidocaine. The pain is beautiful like an open wound. It reminds me of my arm and when I fell, I heard a crack. Then nothing, just numb. 
I almost lost it. It was summer and I had been wearing a sling. I had a tan line where screws came in and out, numb, infected. A nurse came every day to stick a swab deep in it, scrape out the infection, to scrape down scraping bone. That was real pain with a happy ending. It once was a comfortable home. And that's how the chapter ends and goes into the second chapter, which would be the second uh, uh, chain, train stop on the way home, which was central. So that's my uh, book, Train of Thought 2, Almost Home. Um, and great. yeah, so. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jason. That's a great, that was great reading. Really intense. Thanks. So I've got a, some questions about your reading and if other folks have some questions, let's put them in the chat and we'll get to them. So your poems, they all are attached in the first part of your reading. The last line was the title of the next one. Do you uh, pause between writing the next one or were you in this whole train of thought type of situation that you just continue to be like, I'm breaking it here. How did that work? Well, um, I would tend to write um, a title of a poem like in the first train of thought the, the the poem was called renaissance of thought and that was like the the first line of the the title of the first poem then by the end of the poem um you know this was all written on note notebooks so i would end at the end of the line or at the end of the uh page and, and basically uh, a poem would take me from trains you know with my headphones on to get to the end of the next train station or to the next where i had to go and it was a long commute it was like 45 minutes so i would always have time to write and i always took the time to um to stop with the every poem i ended when I would start again, I would start with the next the title, and that's kind of how I got the train of thought idea um, to, to to basically play on the fact that it was all kind of it was all kind of a, a, a fluid in a way. It was it was all kind of all related in in some some form or another. Did you start a poem at the beginning of the commute, and did it end? Did you end your writing when you arrived at your station and, and then work with it? Or uh, did, you, did you not have that structure? Um, so this book was um, loosely edited. And I'll be honest with you, it's loosely edited. That means it's as almost as raw as my notebook possibly can get. Um, unfortunately, I look at it sometimes. And I'm like, man, this is 2012. And I've evolved so much as a writer since then. And I've done so much. Um, but I wanted to really show what it's like to be just gripped with anxiety on, on a train or um, just kind of stuck in somewhere and you had to write and that was the only way to get through it. So um, if a poem ended at the end, like there, there might be a line that says like, and you know, and, and the next stop Davis, it's almost time to stop. And that would just be the end of the poem. Um, and then the next line would be, it's almost time to stop. Um, and then I think that one was called This is Madness because I was really going through it. So it's almost time to stop. And it said, this is madness. So well, Jim, asks, Jim asks, can you imagine the whole book as one really big poem? Yeah, I, I could. Um, I mean, as I said, it's kind of a stream of thought. So um, it all kind of flows into, I mean, it's all with only departures of some poems like Grace on a Train, where it is from my first, from this book right here that I didn't read, but it imagines me, I was looking at someone, I was imagining what her life was like. Um, you know, it, it does play out kind of like what my life was like. So in a way, it's kind of autobi autobiographical. Um, it's a little bit of fan, fan, fanta uh, Fantasy, you know, when uh, you're on the the plane uh, on the train and you're just kind of letting your mind uh, roll. Um, I think every uh, every poem in this book is sort of uh, it's a collection, right? So, Train of Thought One and Train of Thought Two is a complete collection of of uh, of one almost like a year or two of work of work on 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 the red line writing. So. Yeah, I think it, 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 I, I would consider these two out of all of the poems that I've written. I, I, uh, you know, if you go to Oddball Magazine, you can see that I've written many poems since then. This is a collection of poems that starts and ha it has a story and it has a, a beginning and an ending. 
together you read them and it makes all it's a complete picture you know um all right so you've mentioned that you evolved as a writer so tell me about what it was like when you started writing and how you've evolved did you always write in the stream of consciousness way or uh, has the process changed so for me the process is a um usually starts with um music or uh, or some sort of technique um, often when I'm blocked I will write free prose on the page and then just re- that that just reminds me that it doesn't have to have anything and that it will form into something um, having the ability to use um, you know editing you know my Microsoft Word and stuff where I write all my poems now um, you know I I write it I write all of it and then I edit it down into as succinct as I want it. Um, uh, I will play with forms sometimes. I like to play with rhythms and the order of things. And sometimes I put anachronistic poems. I think that's the right word. Um, Sometimes I put all sorts of different um, things together. Uh, With Oddball Magazine, we have, uh, I have a constant deadline of every week I have to produce a a poem. So um, I just published my 400th poem on Oddball. Um, and I was, um, you know, the, the last poem I wrote, uh, record scratches, um, was a really, really cool poem that I wrote that I almost wanted to read, but I, I don't have it with me. Um, I'd love to, sh- love to show that to you guys and play with the form. Cause that's pretty much one of, uh, one of my most recent poems that really played with the form. So it's called the record scratches. Um, and if you look at it on Oddball Magazine, it's pretty, pretty cool. So uh, your forms and your poetry you read tonight was very playful. Are there poems or poets that you find inspire you that are of similar vein? Um, I, I'm inspired by many poets. Um, I think a lot of the poets that I'm inspired by are... Uh, singers and songwriters um but also there's poets like uh, charles bukowski who i um love and uh, uh love his his bare knuckle style of writing um i've i've in, in a lot of my poems i've written about keats and i've written about dickinson and i've written about plath and i've written about e.e e. cummings and um i love pop culture references in my poetry i think it enriches it so i always put like almost in every poem there's some sort of nugget of of a pop culture reference in the last poem i wrote on oddball i referenced sublime 40 ounces to freedom um and and you know I, that was just one of the I just love pop culture references and I get that from, uh, I, f- I find it special when you connect with an author. Um, for instance, there's a song by No Effects called 13 Stitches where he basically just talks about all of these albums. No, he, he said when uh, he went to The Descendants for the first time and then he talks about all these bands that he saw. And then there's another song called um, I knew you were the one where he talks about all this, this comparing records with his girlfriend and all of those, you know, I was like, Oh yeah. I, you know, I think I mentioned, um, uh, uh, you know, the damned and, and, and this, and this book. Um, so, um, there's a lot of pop culture references. Um, and as I said, I kind of like the, the hard nosed style of, of, uh, of Charles Bukowski. And I like the, the, the playfulness of, um of lyrical wordplay so wherever that comes from so i listen to a lot of music so um okay yeah. last question about your work um yeah. it's from linda linda said i noticed you read quite fast is that deliberate to add to the feel and it definitely added to the intensity she said so was it deliberate or is that just how it was tonight you know um i tend to read how my my I feel that the poem tempo is and all these poems are frantic a lot of them are frantic some of them are slow like that that one poem I wrote about the um was I was thinking of when I broke my shoulder and how horrible it was when the nurse would come and 
work on my basically fix. I had a hole in my shoulder and, the, and the, I had to have it scraped every day. And I remember just thinking of how awful that was. And one day on the train, I just wrote that and it was slow. And when I read it, I read it slow because it's intense. Um, I, it depends. I mean, as I said, I, I've written so, so many, so many poems recently. Um, some go slow and have, it depends. Uh, if you listen to something with a high tempo when you're writing, um, you might, I mean, a lot of the time it will be a, a high tempo poem. I also like when I'm in the wordplay phase of things, just reading things really fast. Um, the poems recently I've written lately um, are more slow tempoed and um, I don't know, I really like the record scratches. I wish I could have read it for you guys. I just didn't get it. It's on oddballmagazine.com. All right, so uh, Oddball Magazine morphed into the Oddball Foundation in 2020 and became a nonprofit, and it was a way to give back to the community. The process and the continuing process of running a foundation, how difficult is it, and what are some of the challenges? One of the challenges of, of it is persistence, and when I say persistence, I mean being um a seed to a tree. And what I mean by that is growing a, um, from an idea, percolating from an idea to a full-blown foundation it took a long time. It took a lot of growth. It took a lot of uh, long nights and a lot of days just grinding on projects. Um, I figured because I have oddball magazine and then that morphed into the oddball show podcast i felt like the next step was to talk and combine my passions which um have always been about helping out the little guy just in general um helping out the oddball or helping out the person who is picked on you know you know pick pick last in gym class you're first in my book you know um so I like to like to talk about mental health a lot and um, because it's affected all aspects of my life um, in good ways and bad ways. And I wanted to bring back, um, I wanted to bring back to the community and also to intentionally advocate. So to have my organization established, it's, it's intentional advocacy. So when I have um, poets on my podcast or, or the writers who are published in oddball it's letting them use their voice and you know and the people on the podcast I asked them about um, the nonprofits and stuff that they support and the foundation we just we do community events so um, I really want to lessen um, I want to improve the world while I'm in it and uh, for that I'd like to uh, bust down mental health stigma and, and, and help out with the social justice movement and kind of preserve environmental, um, you know, the, the, the environments, uh, environmental action is important to me as well. So I just figured it would be good to combine all that into a foundation. Now how do artists merge with mental health advocates and social justice advocates? Do artists, poets, writers, musicians, is it seamless or is it sort of, um, you know, like, jamming a car into gear at times it's it's sometimes it's it's interesting because if we're talking about the oddball show i've had to kind of um switch up my formula where um someone might be a ma mainly an advocate um but the idea is to have some sort of performance on the show right so um if they're talking about some sort of mental health thing like one person was talking about this modality of um, neurofeedback. Well, they weren't necessarily a writer, but they had a poem that they had written a long time ago, so they read it. Um, then we kind of switched the conversation into the impacts of, of neurofeedback and all those kind of things um, and how that could help out with like mental health. Um, I think advocacy, I think a lot of poets and a lot of authors and a lot of writers have causes that they're passionate about. I can't think of one person in, in the audience here that probably doesn't have some cause or something that fuels their writing. Um, and I, I think it's not too difficult to merge an advocate with an artist. I, I, I don't see the difference. 
Now, are we turning the corner in terms of the stigma around mental health and mental health issues? Absolutely, we are. There's a lot to do. I mean, there's a lot more, there's a lot more um, awareness. There's a lot more awareness about that, and that's great. There's still a lot to do about, there's still a lot of, there's a lot of empathy that needs to be um, shown to people who are actually going through it. Because it's great to talk about it when you're on the other side of it, but when you're in the middle of it or in the midst of it, or you're going through something, you need more support. Um, I think also the, the, other, the other main thing that needs to be changed about mental health amongst other things is, is understanding um, the, the idea of in, uh, institutionalism is not necessarily, uh, institutionalizing and medication are not the two answers to solving someone's trauma. And in fact, can make more, uh, much more of a, a problem in someone's life. And um, I, I liked, the reason why I have a podcast is because I like to interview people who have, who can speak on that because um, they've gone through it, you know, or speak on that because they're an expert on it and those kind of things. Um, have we turned the corner of, of mental health? I think we're trying to. In 2012, um, I couldn't tell anyone that I had a mental health diagnosis of, of schizoaffective disorder. I couldn't tell anyone that. Um, if I did, they would have judged me. Um, and being on the train, absolutely no one cared that I was struggling and that I had headphones on. Um, now there's a lot of peer support. Now there's a lot of uh, knowledge about mental health. And, and now there's a lot more inclusivity and a lot more um, trauma-informed kind of uh, a trauma-informed attitude on, um, you know. Yeah, I, I, I feel attitudes are changing around it. And I think that's wonderful and great. But I'm going to ask you a really tough question that uh, it's all people can talk a good game. But, it, but everything is good with mental health until there's a family member that's freaking out or there's like a, a mass shooting when they're talking about what's well, either guns or that person has mental illness. Yeah. So how do we how do we reach that far deeper realm that, you know, that's a button people push like, OK, I'm going to push the mental health button when I can't do anything else or I'm empathetic to a mental health, but keep my aunt out of my house at Christmas. Exactly. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, I think one of the things that we need, you know, in general in society is, is to know what trauma informed, uh, trauma informed view is and knowing, uh, looking at people as not someone who is being uh, aggressive or something, but someone who's really going through something who's experienced something. I understand that it's hard when someone when you have a family member um you know the bipolar aunt or whatever you want to say and people joke or whatever you know my, my my aunt's bipolar or whatever you know like um there's a lot of negative connotations to to it but there's also a lot of i don't i don't see the i understand that my life's a little bit more difficult because i have had a diagnosis and i've had to walk a different road and for that i have a lot more empathy for people especially being a peer support specialist and knowing that um, the, the, the people that I support who are quote unquote, have some sort of trauma or have a diagnosis or are mental, quote unquote mentally ill are some of the nicest people that I've ever met. People who are striving for their recovery either substance, substance use or mental health um, are uh, incredibly uh, cool people. Uh, we all, I, I like to think that, you know, there's really no difference between the person who diagnoses you and, and, you know, the person who diagnoses you and who takes the diagnosis. I mean, I don't know. I, I think that it's, it's kind of labeling people this and that. And, and I, I don't know, I think that everything that we experience, I think mental health is sort of a fallacy in a way, the whole, the whole system is kind of, uh, uh, it's basically labeling everyone and every single thing. You have, you're sad, you have, you know, depression, you're, you're shy, you have social anxiety disorder. It's very, it's, I mean, it, I understand that, like, that's very much marginalizing it, but I also understand that I feel that DSM-5 is, is kind of, the, the whole book is just about a bunch of generalities and, and mental health is a spectrum. 
And I think the real problem is when you're put on med medications because they teach you to go on the medications, but they don't tell you how to come off of them. And when you start to come off of them and your symptoms come back, it's not really your symptoms. It's actually like a withdrawal or, or the medications leaving you, but it represents symptoms. And I think one of the things that we, we don't understand um, are how to deal with people when they are going through it. And that's when people call, they get, you right, you said, like get her out of the house and get her an extra level of care. But honestly, that extra level of care might be more destructive than just having a conversation and sitting down and talking to that person and letting them, and, and letting them know that you're there for them and that they matter. And that's kind of, instead of, putting them in restraints and putting them in a psych ward. So there are, I like how you mentioned, that's a really great answer. And I liked how, um, I always this question, DSM-5. DSM-5 is like the physician's handbook that has every diagnosis and their definitions. It's, uh, it's the Bible for shrinks, pretty much. Yeah. And uh, so I like how you answer that question and how you um, definitely hit upon the systematic problems of medication and diagnosis. I think a very easy systematic problem to fix is everyone that goes into an office for therapy or to seek help, help automatically gets a diagnosis just because they're there. Um, is that something that you feel could be changed or changed easily? I honestly think there's a couple of things that could be changed. Um, and one thing I think is to, this, this is how I feel about, and anyone can have a diagnosis. I was talking to someone, um, a family member who was talking about how, you know, they once experienced depression, um, but they didn't, ex but the situation they were in was what was depressing them. Well, here's the thing. If they went in and said like, I'm experiencing depression, you know, and then they're given Prozac or whatever, you know, all of a sudden they're on a, a antidepressant. Now you're messing with some real medications that can either do, now you have a chemical imbalance because you've just threw meds into your system. So now you have a chemical imbalance. Um, I think that the interesting thing about um, diagnosis is, is, right, is yes, it's comforting when someone says, oh, you know, what you're experiencing actually is a, is a disorder. Um, I guess that's comforting in knowing where you, where you land in the world of mental health. But as I've learned, Mental health is a spectrum. Um, anxiety can show up as OCD. Um, it, it's just, it's just very, it's, it's, it's just a spectrum of uh, from hearing voices to to flights of mania. It's, it's all very much, um, it's fluid. It's, it's all based on, and any any situation that someone's experiencing could be labeled some other diagnosis. And there's there's thousands of misdiagnoses. Um, so I think one of the, uh, the things that is, of course, it's important to maintain our mental health, right? It's important to maintain our mental health. That doesn't mean that we throw medications at it and just try and, uh, you know, not resolve the problem by talking about it or, or getting peer support or something. I think once we're on, once we're on medications, it's incredibly hard to get off of them. And I, that's what my, my one time having a manic episode you know, 20 years ago, um, evolved into all of a sudden I'm doing the same exact shit, but now I'm, I'm on Depakote, you know, and this is like 20 years ago and, you know, I'm doing the same stuff. Now I'm on Depakote, but now, uh, you know, now I'm gaining weight. So now I have to address the fact that I'm gaining weight. So now I'm gaining weight and now I'm, my depression is turning into heavy depression because no one likes me anymore because I've gained a lot of weight. Um, and I can't seem to do what I used to do. So I'm even more depressed. So I really do think it's, it's kind of, a, you know, who put the, the, the horse before the cart kind of thing. You know, I, I honestly think that they're very much, um, I, I think they're incredibly related. Um, is, it, is it the medications that cause the trauma? Is it the trauma that, or, or whatever? Um, is it the diagnosis or the trauma or the trauma or the diagnosis or the prolonged being in the system of mental health? that is the major trauma that people experience. So. Well, I'm really glad that the Oddball Foundation is there to give support and help to people that are struggling. Um, just to circle back to your own writing, do you, are you working on anything right now? Uh, is there something that's going to be coming up? And then, Actually, uh, thanks for uh, ask, asking that, Tim. Um, there's a couple things. Um, 
I of course want to put out a, a book of, of newer material. Um, I feel like I wanted to put out Train of Thought 1 and 2 to basically show what it was like, what I was going through with very little support and no, and, and all, all those kind of things. One thing I've actually been writing um, has been a series of um, stories with poetry called The Peer Perspective. And it talks about um, little, little things that I've experienced. And it's almost like a self-help book from someone who needs help. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's called The Peer Perspective and it's, it's written, um, it, you know, it's written as kind of a, uh, you know, it has quotes in it and then it has a, a story and then what would you do? And, and this is what I would have done and this is what I did kind of thing. And it's, um, it's in the works right now. Um, uh, if you want to really see what um, I've been doing, you know, the, 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 the foundation is really what I've been building and the podcast and um, those kind of things. But as for writing, um, I'm currently working on a book called The Peer Perspective. Fantastic. Uh, so basically, invite everybody to check out oddballmagazine.com and you'll find out everything about the foundation and also what you can do to help. Um, I also suggest that you join the mailing list because there's a whole lot of information and things that Oddball and Oddball Foundation are doing for folks and what they're planning. So I really would I, uh, like to thank uh, Jason for being on the show and it was a pleasure having you and uh thank you tim and folks that might be watching on the facebook live stream you can use the link that's posting in the group to show up at the open mic or to show up next week and ask uh blake butler questions as well so jason thanks very much tim it's a pleasure and thank you so much uh, good luck to you in 2022